Thank you very much, Dave. It's, it's a privilege to be here with all of you. All of that um, is true. Uh, <laughs> And I do uh, love dance movies. I have a secret um, desire to be in a dance crew. Um, so if you know anyone that's looking for someone who doesn't know how to dance to be in a dance crew, I'm your guy. Um, quick plug for any parents, there is a Shorty and Me hip hop dance class at Culture Shock in town. That's pretty fantastic. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, it is a privilege. I've been inspired all day. I think I'm gonna take us in a, a maybe a, a connected but slightly different direction as we um, talk about design. And so what I wanted, you know, it's interesting to have a don't forget the humans when we're having a day centered around human-centered design. But I want to talk about the humans actually in the organization. So what I want to share is 11 uncommon truths for the people who take care of the people, for the people who take care of your customers, for the people who design for your customers. And as Dave already mentioned, so um, Part of Bulldog Drummond, so a local design innovation firm. I joined them recently to launch their people innovation practice. Um, everything from startups to Starbucks. But the important thing for us is the people that we have the opportunity to work with. We always say brands don't excite us. As with all things, consistent with what we're doing here today, we help organizations solve problems and unlock value. And you can call them problems, challenges, uh, issues, opportunities, whatever it may be. How can we? take our level of thinking, which is a lot about simplifying, taking the complex, making it simple, and then taking it through that process, our process of discovery, translation, and action to unlock value in people and in organizations, and certainly for customers, guests, and users. So um, uncommon truth number one, I want to share a little bit about my background um, and how I arrived here and kind of how I arrived in this moment. So, when everyone says, who's a designer, I'm, I kind of like half raise my hand. Um, practicing that license, I don't know what you'd like to call it, but my first career was actually investment banking and corporate finance. In New York and LA, doing mergers and acquisitions for large companies, um, joint ventures and the like. And as I went about that work, I finally realized, I said, there's got to be a reason people get together and work. That's not just about making numbers go from A to B. Not that that's unimportant, but that was held up in the first part of my career as the only thing. And so I did what most people do when they have an existential crisis in their late 20s, they go snowboard. So I moved to Colorado and became a snowboard instructor and then a raft guy. Um, but that's also where I found in, <laughs> is that for Colorado? Is that for snowboard instructing or raft guiding? Yes. Um, <laughs> still a passion, do a little less snowboarding here in San Diego, um, but still love getting back there. But it was in the mountains of Keystone, Colorado that I found an experience design firm in 2006. Changed my world, changed my perspective on what organizations could be. And as we went around and took an organizational approach to experience design, to think through everything from how you, not just how you inspire and personalize, but how places, um, what a place looks like, how you hire, how you train, I kept coming back to this one truth that the moments for brands are often human moments. And it doesn't matter if you're a product company, a service company, or experience company, and I think we're all probably trending that every company really is an experience company. But these moments of truth are human moments. So I had the opportunity to move to San Diego. Um, I, was, I was speaking, I think, with Susan, right? Yes, speaking with Susan, I said my wife and I came here for a year, and now we're on year nine. Um, I think that tends to happen, but I ended up working with Sharp Healthcare. Uh, for those local here, 15,000 person organization on a long journey to transform their experience before moving to a luxury retailer and help them scale across the country. So it went from healthcare, meaningful, to selling fancy toilets with a company called Perch. Um, but how we bring those, or those different spaces out of the ground with people that authentically care about a customer, who have empathy for what people are going through in a remodel or redesign. And then now, um, helping to help organizations around the country. And, the, and last week I was meeting with a client, large multinational organization. We're helping them with some of their brand positioning for a SaaS platform. So complex technology, they've invested millions. And at the end of, the, of our time together, they said, you know, our, we have to be honest, our technology is not all that different. I said, it's really not that different from our competitors. Our data, our proprietary data set is pretty good. Um, but it really comes down to is, are the people that we have and the trust they have in our organization. Will they know that we will be for the, there for them when they need it? And I think you heard it with the individual talking about um, the diabetes company and the, the pump company. He said, well, you know, we have 24 seven by support. That comes down to the person. They know they can reach out in their moment of need. And so when you think of these moments of truth or brands are often human moments, what you also realize is we're really good, I think, at designing places, people, processes, technology, products, experiences, marketing, et cetera. And we often leave this 
notion of designing for the people within the organization to chance, intentionally designing a culture to chance. Um, and the reason is because I think it's both hard and it's squishy. Um, those are really technical terms, I know, hard and squishy, and they probably shouldn't go together. But the idea that people are hard. I mean, you can have two people in the same conversation, they walk out with two, different, complete, two completely different understandings. Or if you put in a design perspective, while we love design and cross-pollinating ideas and get people with different perspectives in the room, we get divergent ideas, when you go, we want a consistent experience for our guests, customers, um, and people that we interact with, then you're going to take all those perspectives and just narrow them. So it's a hard thing to do. And it's squishy. So you're talking about feelings, you're talking about behaviors, and you're talking about actions, and none of that fits really neatly in a spreadsheet. Um, right? So that's where you get this notion that aligning people at scale, and scale really is two. You know, anyone over one, you know, that, that's really scale, because you have two people, two totally different perspectives. But think about when you're, you know, not just IBM, when you're 380,000 people, but when you're 50 people. Or you're opening a second store, you know, maybe 10 miles away. Now you have distance from the nerve center of the organization, the people that have the vision, that are living the culture that they want every single day. So aligning people at scales hard and squishy. And a quick note on culture, and I don't like to say we're in the culture transformation business, because especially in this room, we understand that it's about solving problems. So in some senses, we want to transform our culture. The first question is, why? What gap exists? So I subscribe, we subscribe to a simple definition of what you choose to believe and consistently do. I think we know a lot of organizations that are really good at the belief part. I mean, it's plastered all over their walls when you go in, and like, this is what we believe. And now, because purpose-driven businesses are really important to marketing, you see it on packaging about what we believe and our values. Now, the hard part then is not just the do, but the consistently do. So I want to spend my time just talking about some of the things that, observations and things that we've learned along the way and trying to move people towards that consistently do, to have their aspirational culture and actual culture actually be the same, and that's where authenticity is. So look, the, when we're talking about authenticity, that real culture of your place directly reflects in the experience you provide to customers. Because there's all things you can say, but when that person is interacting, it's, you almost have to treat your team members, this isn't just about being nice, but how do you help your team members understand first treat them well such that it authentically comes across to your customers. Because otherwise, we've all been in the place, and whether it's you know, the sandwich store where you walk in, they say, hi, welcome to Subway, and they say for every single person, because they know they're being graded, it comes across inauthentic. But even if it's, uh, we want people that are innovative within the organization, how are you innovating for the people experience within the organization? So one, they're in a learning laboratory constantly, they understand it, and then they can authentically deliver that in whatever way they impact the customer, be it in design, be it in product building, be it in finance and accounting. And so you start to realize that the culture is your experience to, agree, to a degree. And then you take that back and say, that's what really those moments of truth are with brands. So cultivating culture, like how do we actually do this? And the belief that it is about design, it's not about hoping, it's putting a structure and system in place. Again, focusing on what problem you want to solve. We're working with an organization, and it was, well, we don't really have a lot of trust in the organization. We haven't done a great job of communicating, and we want to create an experience that at least is a launching point that says we can acknowledge some of the challenges we've had, some of the mistakes we've made, and move forward from there. So you can begin designing culture. Um, with that basic, with the, with the baseline, the design principles being your purpose and values as an organization. So a framework that, that I follow um, for designing culture is codify what you believe. Again, I think organizations are getting good at this. And I think where you can go a step further is most organizations are good to understand that, that purpose or mission or values or, or vision rather, whatever you'd like to call it. But, but then when you talk about values, how do you make it understandable to individuals? How do you make it simple? You know, we're, we have the great fortune of working with Jack in the Box, and you're saying, well, how do we launch values to 2,200 locations where people range from 16 to 60? And you say make people feel part of the family is one of their values. Can you imagine that there's maybe thousands of definitions of what family means? So how do you go a layer deeper and make it real to people? To help them understand what outcome you're looking for and to provide some simple actions for them. So as we write value, help organizations mine their values, which come from 
their own people to get into actions is what are three or five ways that you go, this is what it looks like in practice, in context, in our space itself. And it's not about checking the box and go, okay, I'm living the value because I did these three things, which is why you have the outcome statement of, well, this is what we're trying to accomplish, and here's what it can potentially look like in practice. So then you have a chance because people are like, okay, I can, I can begin to understand it in a tangible way, not some values, you know, and, and live our values, right? You're showing them how to live those values. You're putting definition to it. So if you codify your beliefs, something that was brought up already today is how do you bring in people to the organization that share those values? And everyone's like, you know, bring in people that share your values. No one's going to tell you, like, I don't believe in integrity. You know, I'm not about teamwork. I'm not about this, right? So I say, how do you... How do you align people or test people so they have those values close to the surface? So in attracting people to the organization, you start saying, how do you design the candidate experience? What messaging are you using that reflects who you are and how you operate? Because we believe culture is about the decisions and behaviors of people. Um, then you have to give them a chance to understand how you truly operate as an organization. So as you attract people that have those things close to the surface, and there's all different ways people test what I will caution you on, is the idea of culture fit. Because culture fit without some work underneath really looks like the, do I feel like I can have a beer with them test? And that's when you get a lot of people in your organization that probably all look the same, that think the same, that act the same, and they can have a great time when they go out for happy hour, but they really know how to work together in there. They bring in different perspectives. So start thinking of how you align people to your culture, and if you can define it, you could even say, well, look, if, if one of our values is make people feel like family, test when people come into the organization is what does that mean to you? Start seeing if those actions begin to align and not just, hey, they seem like a good person, or if I was stuck in an elevator with them, I'm sure we'd have a good time. Um, that just leads to homogeneity within the organization. So if you codify what you believe, attract people that have that close to the surface, then how do you show what it looks like in practice and connect it to the business? Because people want to think culture, and I'm fine with people, well, culture is about fluff, right? Okay, well, let me just share with you that it's, it's not. We can put some structure and discipline to it and connect it to the business and how you make decisions. Then it starts changing the conversation. And it isn't about, um, and not saying it isn't nice to have kombucha on tap or cold beer or whatever it may be, or craft beer or whatever. Not saying that's not nice and or valued by employees, but that's certainly you know, more about the employee experience they have than the actual culture. So when you show what it looks like in practice, I had the opportunity when I was helping scale um, Perch, and we grew from about 100 people when I got there to 750 people. Um, when I left was we created a lear multi-day learning experience for people coming into the organization called Elements. But they understood why we existed, how we did what we did. We developed empathy for just a retail experience. So we would say, we would send people out to go into different luxury retailers and see how they were treated when they walked in, so they could understand what that was like. Or people on my own team within the organization, that was my first foray into formal HR, um, which is interesting. Um, didn't realize I would have that as part of my portfolio going in, but it was. But everyone that would come into my team, I'd say, go out on a delivery and installation truck within your first week. So you see what it's actually like for people interacting with customers, being in people's homes, and you realize also why safety is so important in the situations that people get in. So now you're starting to, if you can create those learning experiences to show what it looks like in practice, and we just, um, and, and they're in the midst of it, we're working with Bridgepoint as they relaunch their values. And they've created, they've committed to a learning experience for the organization that they are leading. But also what you know happens is you have this big burst of inspiration, like we all got together, we talked about what's important, and then everyone goes back just to their, you know, goes back to their desks, and like two weeks later, like that was a cool time we got together, and you never hear about it again. And that's why you get the term that actually exists of flavor of the month, year, insert whatever it is you want. And then the next time you try and do, people go, yeah, right, and they dig in their heels. Right? Um, so how do you sustain that then over time? How are you keeping the values and these, these essentially operating principles for the organization? How do you keep that refreshed over time? And that was one of the great learnings I had when I was with Sharp Healthcare. So Sharp Healthcare, year 17, I think now, of the Sharp experience. And as much a cultural and employee initiative, hello, you want know, to come sit down? That's okay, it's just a door, it's fine, come, come sit down. Um, but they're on year 17 of a cultural initiative, which they know if we under, help people understand what's important, teach them about the value of, of empathy and caring for others, then we'll show up in the patient experience. And Mike Murphy, the wonderful CEO, who's been there for over 20 years, every single time he says the same thing, it's a marathon, not a sprint. 
and every year they bring people back together at the San Diego Convention Center. They bring groups of 4,000 at a time to help them recommit to the purpose and worth of their work. Now you start seeing like, okay, at least once a year they're getting it in a very consistent way, because again, 40 door fronts, 15,000 people, they're getting it in a very consistent way at least once a year to refresh about what's important about the work that they do. So you can actively cultivate culture through design. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those specific things around how you sustain culture and what those activities and tactics look like. So if you, if you stand for everything, nothing, I think you guys, people know this as designers. Um, organizations sometimes want to be all things to all people or want to say, well, if you name any good human attribute, they go, we want to be that, we want to be that, we want to be that. And the next thing you have is nothing of substance for your team members to hang on to about, again, how to make decisions, how they should act with each other, and how they should act within when they have the opportunity to interact with guests and customers. I think a close cousin to that, and I'll just, we'll talk about both of these together, is the idea that you can't be distinct if you're not human first. So when you talk about activating you know, brand through people, and you look at the different aspects of the brand, whether it's you know, the irreverence of a, a virgin, whether it's the fun of a Southwest, whether it's the adventure of an Airbnb, the outdoors focus of, of REI, or you know, pick any one of the, the poster children you know that you hear have great cultures. If they're not operating as a human company first, then it's hard to, you know, that stuff then just becomes inauthentic. And what I mean by that is a baseline of humanity, of people feeling like they're individually valued, they're, treating, they're being treated with dignity and respect in the workplace. There's maybe a path for them to grow within the organization and they have the opportunity to contribute to someone, something bigger than themselves. That then becomes the humanness. And unfortunately, as, and especially starting in an investment bank, I had a very good understanding of humanness stripped out of, of business. Um, and I think similarly, we're starting to put that back in, but right now still human in an organization is distinct. And that's why people go, we have unique cultures. And yes, every culture is a little bit unique. You pull back the surface and they're just operating and treating people as human beings and not just, again, just cogs in whether it's the design wheel or any other part of the business. And you start to go, okay, we have something special and unique here. Now we can talk about being distinct. Now we can talk about all the ways that our values get expressed outwardly to our customers, how we can do that internally here. You know, people don't really care if they can bring a dog to work, you know, if they're not having a great experience with their leader. Those things, I mean, that's a bad example. Dogs make people happy. Um, <laughs> you know, people don't, maybe don't really care about the, the, the cornhole tournament you have on Thursday, you know, and getting everyone together if they don't have a great experience with their leader, if they're not valued as a human being for their contribution, if the organization just, you know, takes credit for everything or if the senior leaders take credit for everything, or choose to blame within the organization. Or when you talk about the idea of innovation and we want people to put forth ideas, there's a culture of fear about actually taking risks. So all of those human things around are giving people autonomy and say, we value and, and make great decisions. And the first time they make a poor decision, you, go, you pull the reins back really quickly. So all of this humanness within an organization, I think we're starting to figure out, but it's a long journey. And then I think that goes back to the squishy part. Um, I believe working in this type of work is incredibly rewarding, um, but it's not like you always have that end product. <laughs> it's not like, and, and so it is a constant and vigilant journey, you know, as you go and cultivating and crafting the culture that you want within your organization that produces great results, whether it's great design results, but ultimately great results for your customer. So hearing is not the same thing as living. So I wanna go a little bit um, deeper into this notion of, of you have this big burst of inspiration within an organization, we trot out new values, and we maybe have flags or something like that, and everyone gets together. How do you actually start to help people live it? One, people have to understand it on a personal level. And this is also something we don't allow time for in an organization, is the time for personal reflection. Because generally it's about how do we amp up productivity? And I would caution people that think culture is a great way to get people to do more, for whether it's less money or develop or give more time to an organization because they go above and beyond. You know, this notion of engagement as discretionary effort, I caution people on that because that ultimately renders itself inauthentic for your team members. So how can you actually begin helping people live it? So one of the things we do is um, 
which we've created for clients if it's the right decision for them because you can imagine if you can get like a bridge point you get people together 50 in a room for a certain amount of time you can have certain kinds of conversations if you're spread out in 2200 locations with no break room in a 24 7 environment like a quick serve restaurant you have to develop a slightly <laughs> different experience for people but how do they slow down enough to go what does this actually mean for me how do i understand this on a personal level and then just to get that twinge to go well maybe i could do something a little bit different and so one i think there's how do you give people the opportunity to personalize it um, i was talking with, with mark before we started here and he's big into storytelling and and that's the the next way and i think is as designers you understand the value of storytelling people see what it looks like in practice they see what it is in action it translates across the organization i always said at perch if i tell a story we had hundreds of stories of installers in people's homes or you know making cardboard forts with people's kids and we tell that story to someone in atlanta they understand exactly what we're talking about so think of the stories you tell both the good and the bad of, the, of, of ways that we've lived the values and the harder ones are the ones when we kind of missed out and if people have the courage to share those then it creates that sense of trust within an organization. How are you constantly listening to your employees? Again, something within the design thinking of this constant listening to understand what they're going through. Or to go out and just sit among them and be among them and you pick up on different things. So this consistent learning so you can iterate within the organization, within the culture and what you're doing. You know, how are you, what content are you pushing out to the organization and how in a way that can actually be consumed? How are you having these refresh experiences for people? So you start seeing all different tactics and tools um, that can be then adapted to organizations. So this stays front of mind. I mean, I, I usually use the same example. Um, holiday season, I think people are more likely to let you in line, you know, when you're, you're trying to turn left in Pacific Beach. Um, or, and they're less, you know, <laughs> less likely to get mad, you know, when, you know, if you happen to cut them off or anything. It's because there's reminders everywhere, right? There's lights, there's cards, there's, you're getting gifts, you're giving gifts, and there's tons of music around. And I'm not saying that, you know, every organization is about having the holiday spirit, but it's more about what's the principle there? That if it's omnipresent, they're going to be ma making the right decisions. They have the right things front of mind when they have to make decisions. And so to get people to live it is that consistent journey to keep it refreshed and have it get into the different apparatus of the organization, whether it's the policies and procedures, the place itself. I know one of the, the folks this morning talked about the design of spaces. So you start seeing it's not just about people practices. It's about organizational practices where everywhere they look, they can see the values coming to life. So um, instead of just doing this specific exercise, the other thing is when we talk about aspirational and actual culture, there are a lot of unwritten rules in an organization, which is actually the real culture. Again, you, you espouse certain things. You may say, this is how we want to operate. And then it takes someone about 9 to 12 months to actually understand how you really operate. Um, I had the opportunity when I joined Bulldog Drum, and I was just officing out of there for about eight months. And I just started writing down. And I think I wrote about 50 different unwritten rules. And it could just be about office life. Um, it could be about, you know, um, it could be about how our strategy team operated, you know, the fact of who, who does use Basecamp, who doesn't use Basecamp, you know, all the things. And so how to actually get work done. So I want you to take just a quick second. Are there any unwritten rules that you have in your organization? Because if you begin to surface these, you can either look at them and say, that's probably something that doesn't align with who we are. Or something that we have to actually just let people know because that is the true operating structure of an organization. Does anyone have any unwritten rules in their organization? Whether they're the you know, innocuous of you know, don't leave dishes in the sink um, or they'll end up on your desk or air soak is not like a real way of cleaning things um, to, to more how you make decisions and how you work. Anyone think of any? Yeah. Don't interrupt people. All right. So an important one, which, which is not lived you know, in every organization, but important for people to know that they're going to be looked at differently. And it's hard enough coming into an organization. I mean, if you, as you study neuroscience, there's the in-group, out-group. So you're immediately you know, in threat position when you walk into an organization. If they don't know that, it can really impact them. What other unwritten rules do you have? Yeah? Well, I was going to start by saying no soft jazz, but uh, <laughs> uh, don't polish Explain a little bit what do you mean by that. Well, I think we, we, 
So especially with the computer, we jump to refinement too quickly before low fidelity. I read the item phrase today. Mm -hmm. And and that's widely known within your organization. Oh my God, I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it is those. And what I often ask people is, what are those phrases that your leader, you know, typically says? Because that started the unwritten rules because of the impact that leaders have, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So I encourage you as you begin to think and, and as you cultivate the culture, think of what unwritten rules exist. And again, are there ones that are good and that we want? You know, that we really have, you know, we really make decisions at the meeting after the meeting is probably not the best unwritten rule, right? Because then you wasted everyone's time for the first 60 minutes or 30 minutes, whatever it may be. And then there are those wonderful unwritten rules that are great for people to understand so they can get integrated into how people operate and how people work quicker. Um, Okay, and I talked about this a little bit, this idea of just, this, there's a massive focus on engaging employees and let's get engagement scores up and all the, these things like that. And it's good to measure things and I'm not against measuring things, but if you just attempt to engage employees, it is more just to get a score. Create experiences and that becomes, engagement becomes the byproduct of all of that. Engagement is just a byproduct of creating meaningful experiences for people. And that's where you see design can really have an impact within the organization and the human structures. Because these are just four experiences um, within an organization you can design. And it follows along um, the gentleman, and I forgot his name from, from IBM this morning. You know, if you follow his nine, his nine things, then you can follow an employee journey from the beginning to the end, from when they first hear about the organization to after they leave or when they're an alumni of the organization. But you can add to the candidate, new hire, leader, and employee. You can, you can add what is the executive experience, what is the board experience, what's our supplier experience that we have for anyone that interacts with us. So there's all of these rich experiences to design just within an organization. When you think of the candidate experience, and it's innocuous as when they come in for an interview, are people actually prepared? Because everything is going to have an impact on that candidate. For a new hire, how much productivity is lost because they don't understand what's expected of them when they walk in the door and they're not guided to be able to understand the organization. And so how do you design a new hire experience from the day they say yes until 180 or one year into the organization so they realize, hey, I did make the best decision in my life and I feel like I'm contributing at the earliest possible moment. And then the employee experience, and culture being that, that ether within the employee experience, um, also that very real how people make decisions. But that's where you get into things like, what are some of the fun activities we have? What are benefits and what are the benefits to our employees? How are we contributing to our community? What's people's personal journey? How are we looking at the well-being of our employees? And that's where that employee experience, if you look at that uniquely through the lens of your brand, and whether it's in, you know, an Airbnb and we, we're in about adventure, how do you build that into your employee experience? If it's, and I don't know why I think pets are on, on my head, for me, it's a pet food company, absolutely you should allow you know, you know, pets in the office. Um, maybe not horses, but, um, but like, you know, that should be a part of your DNA because that's very, it's very connected to the brand that you have. And then that leader experience. What does it mean to be a leader in our organization? You can take that same value set and put three to five actions that a, that a leader should do to live that value. You can do that same process. But what's the, and I, and I remember, you know, about a, probably about seven or eight years ago or a decade ago when I visited Zappos for the first time, it's like the granddaddy of, of culture, you know, and they said, from the day people walk in, we can, we have a process to take them to leader in seven years. And they probably shortened that, but from, you could be working the phones and be a senior leader within seven years. For them, they had an intentional path for people to do that. We heard some intentional paths today, earlier in the day. So what is the leader experience? How are they getting together? Because leadership, and I imagine a lot of, everyone is an informal leader. Um, I imagine there are a lot of formal leaders in the room, but sometimes it's, it's a lonely gig. And as much as everyone tells you it's great to be vulnerable as a leader, it's, it's sometimes hard to really do that. So as you design experiences, I'd also um, provide one other uncommon truth that productivity, um, which look, productivity is a part of the equation. We want people to be productive and efficient to make sure they're doing the right things. We want people to enjoy their experience and feel like they're impacting the world in some way. 
but it comes through unproductive moments. I like to call them forced moments of serendipity, which sounds weird. Um, I don't know if that necessarily goes together, but there are all of those times and whether they are designed, and it is the getting people together. And this isn't about force fun and let's all play capture the flag because everyone knows what happens. You just go to your own teams anyway. But the beauty of sort of cross-pollinating ideas and how do you design into your experience in your office or into the office itself, ways that people can just bump into each other. Because all the way, you know, the, the example that most people use is when Steve Jobs redesigned Pixar's offices, he put one common core of bathrooms in the middle for everyone. So accountants and animators had to bump into each other. You know, we, when I was at Perch, we had a, uh, we had a simple rule is you can't take food back to your desk. Have lunch, have lunch out here, find a seat. And there isn't going to be a seat where you can always stay in your group. And what happens from that, and why that leads to productivity, at least my belief is it leads to productivity, is if you have relationships, you're more likely to reach out if you need help and not just send an email because you can say, I did something, right? You're actually going to reach out to that individual. Um, you're more likely, if, that, if you feel that someone's made a mistake or an error, um, you're more likely to actually go and talk to them and say, hey, help me understand what happened here, rather than go, they probably did that on purpose or just you know, do the... Worst thing you can do in corporate culture is act passive aggressively. Um, that needs to be cut out and ripped out of the throat immediately and with, uh, with, with great mouths. Um, separate talk. Um, but, but how can you build in potential moments which would be viewed as unproductive? There's no straight line ROI story. You know, there's no, if, you know, if we get people together on a morning basis so we can do whether even it's a, a book club or have an outside speaker come in or um, whatever activity seems unproductive, where people aren't at their desk knocking off the next task on their list, those will lead, as long as you design for that relationship building, will lead to productivity exponentially over time. And this is um, just because number 10 doesn't mean it's at the end, it's unimportant, because it's probably the most important one. Like, if leaders aren't going to live it, um, just, just take it down, because you have a constant reminder of, of the inauthenticity of your workspace. And I'm not here up here to tell you, like, hey, you know, make sure you fire faster and get rid of leaders. Um, that has to happen over time, and it's one of the hardest things to do if you have leaders that aren't living it. First thing is support that individual. If you don't have self-awareness, that's a longer journey, that the lead time is probably longer than an organization can afford on that one. But when you talk about leaders, then think of a framework for what it means. You know, it's, it's great to say, you know, live it, right? Um, again, what's a framework for people actually role modeling in the organization? I break it down into four ways. Um, visibility. You can't role model if people don't see you. If you are, whether it's all, I mean, you know, said there's definitely work out with clients because you have to bring in money, so I get that. But if you're behind your desk all the time, or if you're on a floor, if you're in a big building, big office building, and stay in the executive floor, um, and you're not visible, you can't possibly role model. Solution, find new people as a leader. Take, you know, if you want to say, be outside your comfort zone, demonstrate that. Just go have lunch with someone that you don't know. Demonstrate that. Be visible so people can see what culture actually looks like. Um, second one is discipline. There's a discipline to being a leader. And my simple definition of discipline that I, that um, when I remind myself that I get mad because it's so simple and it works, um, is you know you should do something, you don't want to do it, you do it anyway. That to me is discipline. Whenever I don't want to do something, I'm like, ah, got to have this one. Um, but the discipline of a leader when they don't want to be a leader maybe in that moment. Maybe they're shuffling off to the next meeting and they see someone who looks like they're having a bad day. Have that discipline to stop and just ask. Or the proverbial piece of paper that no one will see you pick up because it's 30 yards away and go over there and pick it up. And it's not just because people may see you do it, it's because it's the right thing to do. So there's a discipline in being a leader. I think there's also the language you choose to use. Speak the language of the organization. Tie things to the values. When you make decisions and provide context, constantly use the language of the organization. People are like, okay, enough. Why are you, you know, okay, I get it. And go, no, that, this is who we are. It's important and we need to keep it refreshed. And importantly, don't make fun of the language of the organization. Right, so whatever phrases your, your leader may use or your CEO may use, don't be that leader that sort of you know, uses it as a punchline. Because people, what do you permit, you promote as a leader. And so if you start doing that, everyone else, you're implicitly giving people permission to do the same thing. And then I think the, the last one is just awareness. 
as a leader, there's vigilance around awareness. And what is the framework for you to have awareness of who you are as a leader? And yes, there's formal 360s, but who are those people that are going to give you just honest feedback and make sure you're preparing yourself to get it? Because the power of a leader is incredible. I mean, it could be the sticky note on someone's computer like that just says, great job, and then they're riding high for three weeks. And I've seen it happen. Right? Or it's the flippant response on the way out the door on a Friday, and that person thinks about it the entire weekend. And that literally ruins their weekend. And leadership is that incredibly powerful. So you think of role modeling, it's the visibility you have, how you're aware of some of the blind spots, because we all have them. This isn't about perfection, but it's about striving to be better each day. The language you choose to use, and the discipline you have as a leader. I mean, the easiest way to almost encapsulate all of those and I imagine a lot of people do it in this room is when you get into work, just take a lap and say hi to people. It's the, probably the best four minutes you spend of your day. And just have those simple conversations so they can see you, you can interact, you can build relationships, and you can directly translate culture. And then um, we'll go story time after that. Uh, and then the last thing is just everything speaks in the organization. I think you know that in design. Everything's either additive or takes away. There is no neutral in an employee experience. And so when they walk into a room, even if it's, a, you know, we're in benefit season, now we walk into a room and like, does the benefits person understand the organization or is, it, or is the projector set up and you're wasting their time for 15 minutes? But on the same point, you'll say, hey, always be prepared for a client, right? But will you be prepared for them? You know, if you, if you walk in and you know, and the same chair has been broken for a year. We say, you know, you know, details matter to our client. Well, they don't matter in our own office. So everything is going to speak, and I think as, as designers, you understand that. But every, you know, culture ends up being a collection of the micro interactions within an organization. And so it, it, you can intentionally think about every moment. You can certainly do your best. Again, no organization is going to be perfect. No organization is for everyone. Um, and that's okay. Um, that's perfectly okay. Well, thank you.